remember is that it was, was no organized effort. It sort of started in a BRH hour in Baylor and at that time I was asked to give my uh, personal testimony of how I became a Christian and somehow the spirit began to move. I certainly didn't plan to be involved. I guess it was just a, a spiritual appointment that I had with the Lord and came on this campus at a time when it was ready to blossom. And I was just so naive that I wanted to do what God wanted me to do with my life. On the campus they were talking about wanting a youth revival uh, somehow on the campus and that was being talked about, and it was a sort of a spontaneous thing that came up. And that was beginning the prayer meetings and the excitement, and the moral climate was great, even though we were in World War II. I was a freshman, and my brother Bo was about a senior. Longing, longing for Jesus. In the place called Baylor, at a time of spiritual history, God Almighty brought an atmosphere to the campus. A lot of students were overseas. The enrollment had been devastated at Baylor at this time, but students were beginning, military personnel were beginning to trickle back in. And uh, there was a kind of urgency. Well, it kind of grew. And it was in everybody else's uh, desire and prayer that something like that would happen. And that was the start. First of all, we learned very soon that kids can win kids. The pastoral support that coalesced around us these were pastors trusting their young people in these youth revival services to a group of green, inexperienced kids. We learned right quick in that first fan out revival it would be very healthy if Bela got outside of Bela's perimeters and got to those homes. And so I came to Bela on fire and wanting to be a part of the spiritual activities on the campus. The sheer boldness of a bunch of kids preaching the gospel, unprepared as we were, was thrilling in itself and electric. It was electrifying, and we found out that it had a magnetic power. There were a group of men who were predisposed to be used of the Spirit of God at just the right time in our culture and in the timing uh, of the day. We didn't have any organized prayer meeting or anything like that. But people were praying that there would be a revival meeting. The fellows started praying nearly every night on the campus. The answers to prayer that unfolded in a steady and to us miraculous series of events uh, was the most, most dominant single feature about uh, the youth revival movement. That was the first time I had ever had an answer in my heart to pray, to prayer, in a prayer meeting, where God said, I'm going to do this. And those times got to be so important to us, it started affecting the life on the campus, and the students were talking to one to another 
about what was going on. And we were pleading with God for spiritual awakening at Baylor. It was not us or anyone particular but God's spirit moving in answer to that prayer. And when it hit, there was such power given and granted to such immature hands. We didn't know what to do with it. We just were there. It was as though there were a bunch of little empty cups. And the father came with his giant pitcher and he filled the Jack Robinson cup and the Howard Butt cup and the Bo Baker cup and the, and the, the Bruce McKeever cup. And finally he got down at the end, there was a little bitty cup down there filled up Jess Moody. But I'll tell you something, no matter the size of the cup, if it's full, it's full. Can't get any fuller. These men and others who were so much a part of the getting ready team determined the date and the time and a place. And we worked and we waited and we wondered what would happen and could we, could we see something beyond our years and experience. And then we heard it. My soul coming down the main street of the city of Waco was this huge crowd of students, and they were the Baylor students that had come from the campus and walked downtown, and here they came up the street under a banner, Youth for Christ. And out there at the tent, we heard them coming, and we knew it was something holy. As far as I was concerned, I was wanting to see this, the meeting we were having, the first one would be successful and give glory to God. And we pray that God will use it uh, uh, in, into the future, uh, not knowing that uh, what was going to happen. The first revival, as you know, was in 1945, and Ray was one of the preachers. He preached on going my way. Houston called and said, come meet us in a revival. And then, of course, from there it was Fort Worth, and then it was Dallas. and It spread like wildfire all over Texas. In Dallas, they were having been home about a week, this big youth revival service. Well, I didn't know what that was. My mother said, well, it's a bunch of guys and girls from Baylor University, and uh, they're going to have these big services out in Cole Park. Then it was Birmingham and Chattanooga and Memphis and San Antonio and Honolulu. And then in a few years, there were youth revivals going all across the South uh, from Texas uh, clear to the, to the East Coast. After we'd been in Fort Worth just a few days, we heard on the radio about a youth revival that was going to take place. And uh, I was invited to go with the young people, several hundred people made decisions that night. It was very thrilling, and I was one of those. And it was a time of uh, recommitment, rededication, as I was looking forward to my Baylor days and to my future. And uh, the revival was exactly what I needed at that time in my life. And throughout the Bible, and from the beginning of the early church, they've always had music. The music that has been placed in the heart is an overflow of what has happened in trusting Christ. And there's a melody, and especially for me, I love a, I love a tune, I love a, a melody. I was lost in the ways of the world. I was a Christian, all right. But like so many young people, I thought the world was glamorous. I thought it had something. I found there was nothing there but emptiness. What am I fighting for? What have I got? And I realized that the only thing I really had left was Jesus. And he came into my heart. And since then, I've been a new person. Things have been different and things have been wonderful. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes, of course, I feel sorry for myself, like anyone would. But he's put a song in my heart and a joy in my heart that I've never known before. There's nothing like him. There's nothing like him for young people, for a young person. The preaching and the singing had such heart.
such great heart, and I praise the Lord for it. All of a sudden, we were involved with crowds that we could not imagine. We also knew that and expected to be surprised because of the work of God's Holy Spirit in the meetings in which we were involved. I went, and my mother and dad went, and my brother and all, and I really didn't like it. Uh, I know now why I didn't like it, because what I heard was what I wanted to hear, but I really wasn't ready to hear it, I think. I kept thinking, no, I don't know, that, that sounds a little too, I don't know, I don't know whether, well, I kept going back, I kept going, going back, and then. I think the earmark of the movement was in theos, enthusiasm, God in us, and we didn't realize it maybe to the fullest extent at that time. I kept going back, I kept going, going back, and then... The next day, my mother said, are you going back tonight? And I said, well, no, I don't think so, Mom. I, I think I have some other things I want to do. <clears throat> she said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you do whatever you want to do. But I've invited all those young men who are doing the preaching, and a lot of them who are involved in it, to come over to our house for, uh, for some refreshments after the service. And I was hoping that you could be here. <laughs> well... I was trapped, so I went, and I came to my house with great reluctance. I really I felt like I didn't want to be with this bunch. I, I had kind of gotten the idea that uh, to be a Christian was something you did if you were not proficient at something else. Uh, that if you weren't a real good student, well, you could always be a Christian. You know, if you, uh, I had sort of that bad attitude that uh, being a Christian was just sort of the leftovers of life. Jack Robinson was an unbelievable point guard who set all the standards. All-American, then Olympics. So they asked me to preach, and uh, it, it uh, Jess preached the first night, and that made it harder than ever. He got up, and he was Jess for 40 minutes. I looked around. I didn't know. I said, is this way what you do? And to have Jack Robinson on our team all of a sudden meant that the entire enterprise had been lifted into a whole new dimension in the eyes of kids that we hope to reach. But what got me were these guys were incredibly brilliant. I mean, not only great athletes, but great students and uh, very gregarious people, very likable people, nothing phony about them, no pious kind of talk. And they were openly and positively affirming God's love and God's grace, and they made me feel like I was part of them. I, I, it, it was not so much what I heard them preach. It was their spirit and their attitude and their obvious inclusion of me that made me feel differently. And I began to help with the publicity, and that brought me into contact with people like Howard, people like Bo, people like Bruce, people like Ralph. And they began to reach out to me. The movement changed for a lot of young people the image of church and the image of church people. What I saw was honest friendship and concern. And I believe Ralph Phelps preached. I know Bo Baker was leading the music. I was way in the back. But I walked down that aisle, and I walked up to, I believe it was Bob Harris, as I remember, and he said, what decision are you making? And I said, I don't know. I just know I need to give my heart to the Lord in a way that I've never done before. And then he made a public commitment later, and then within a matter of, it seemed to me, weeks, <laughs> he was speaking, and speaking with immense power. We had absolute confidence that we had no confidence, and that it couldn't happen if God Almighty didn't do it. All of us together didn't have a good sermon. And, uh, really. Well, I, I think all of us felt hopelessly unprepared. We had been plunged in far over our heads. And each one of us had maybe two or three sermons. 
Well, I've heard some of those sermons a hundred times. I've heard Ralph Langley preach, don't die on third. I can preach it as well as he does now, probably. It, it was thrilling to me to hear the, the, the young preachers preaching the same sermons. That's okay. That's, it's worth preaching once. It's always worth preaching time and time again. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. It happened. And then the Spirit came. Then W.F. Howard was God's instrument to organize it. And uh, from that day forward, we, we said to Dr. Howard, help. And he looked at us and uh, helped organize this. And of course, I need not tell you that for at least 10 or more years through the office, there were hundreds and hundreds of revivals scheduled. And thanks to Dr. Howard, who next to my mother and father and my wife Martha, is the most influential man in my spiritual life, without any question. It, it, it was a miracle in the making uh, that we, the dimensions of which we did not, could not appreciate or recognize. And I thank God still, I don't think as a day passes, I don't thank God for uh, youth revivals and for what he gave us as opportunities to have a part in that. He told us about uh, laundry and how not to leave laundry bills behind and uh, to clean up the room and not to, not to tear up an apartment, Howard, like we did Mrs. Emerson's apartment. Uh, not, not to do that. It's been a long time for this confession. <laughs> we enjoyed one another and we enjoyed one another's insights. And uh, humor was a great thing. We played a lot of tricks on one another in one way or another. Uh, we did not take ourselves so seriously. We took what we were doing very seriously, but if anybody began to kind of get to be kind of pious and kind of holy, we started talking about, oh, he's the Holy Joe. He's the new, he's the new Holy Joe. Come on back down to the level with all the rest of us. And then I remember that marvelous sermon by one of our number on Samson, yeah. where he called him Tarzan all the way through. If you look at the hair on these men in front of you here, there's a lot of snow on the roof, but obviously the fire is not out in the furnace. What I was thinking, and have thought for many years, how God is able to take people of different backgrounds and mold them together and use their distinctives to unify his cause. We were so diverse. Remember, third of them were post-millennialists, third of them were amillennialists, third of them were premillennialists. We didn't care. You see, to us and to Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians in 1946, Jesus was this big. And our doctrine, while important, was smaller than Christ. We responded by faith in what we thought was right. We can sit around talking about uh, how this, how that, who will do this, who will do We just did it. Paul and I would pull out after a Sunday night of being there for a full week of revival, and we'd see the life of this town fade in the distance, and it hurt because we know that we may never get a chance to tell them that Jesus loves them. I'd like to go back and do every meeting I ever did and try harder. Youth revivals, they marked me for life. They marked me for life, for good, and for God. Lord, if there's any way we could express to you the glory that you deserve for using us so undeserving and just letting us see a little bit of what you would do and what you did. I can say the last day I have on this earth, God used me one time. I remember. And I have nothing to tell you. He's going to use me again. 
He's using me right now as he's using you. It has continued through the spiritual vigor of the people who were involved across all these years since that time. Beyond anything that any of us may ever have thought we would do, God did it. And we give him the thanks and the credit for it. What would you need to do is to study, be open, learn from others, uh, take your work very seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously. Know how to witness to others and to share your faith. So whatever your talent is and your excitement and your blessing you, that has been given of God, use that to take the gospel. Out. This is your time to let God's leadership be seen in you, whether it's on a campus, in a church, a county meeting, wherever, just to let God lead you as if it was the very first time in revival. And there have been many stages of my Christian growth. Some have been very painful. That will be true for you. But you will find that God is faithful and He remains constant, dependable, and trustworthy. My theology has gone in a lot of directions. I've had my doubts and difficulties, as all of us do. I know enough about most of these men on this platform to know that they, like I, have walked through their own valleys of the shadow. But the one thing I am forever and devoutly certain of, I met Jesus. Tonight I believe our holy Lord looks down upon the students of Baylor University and asks this question. Students, with the possibility and the hour in which we live and the challenges that confront you and that confront me, what will you do with it? What are you making? What are you carving into your character? And would there be students this evening hour that would say to God, me no, no, and if I did not believe that the God in whom I trust and in whom I worship could reach down upon this college campus this year and take the lives and the hearts and the bodies and the souls of you students and cause the world to shake by God's grace, then I fear I could not preach from the blessed word. What could this group do? What could one life do this year wholly dedicated to God? What would happen if one student claimed the promise, I will be wholly his this year for Christ? Now, I don't know about you, fellow students. I don't know your ambitions. I don't know your stars. I don't know that castle that you built in dreams. But I do know this, as long as there is one life that is underprivileged, as long as there's one soul in the path of sin, as long as there's some land that has not heard the gospel, the mantle of responsibility goes around your shoulders. Don't you look some other place. Would to God tonight every student here would rise in the great call to arms and say, yes, please God, Here's my life and my talent and all that I am or ever could be. Lord, here am I. Oh,